let's 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 start all over because that that may have may have been that I didn't. Are you erasing the first part? To go through all your speech again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, this is uh, May 10th, I guess it is. I mean, April 10th, 1991. And uh, as everybody knows, this is the 50th anniversary of the start of World War Two uh, coming up in December will be Pearl Harbor Day, or December seventh. Uh, the Montgomery County Historical Society, uh, in cooperation with uh, the American Legion of Veterans of Foreign Wars, are as uh, to commemorate this this uh, anniversary, are doing videotapes of of men and women in Montgomery County who had uh, doing videotapes to tell about their experiences in World War II. Uh, we're going to use these tapes uh, by putting them in the local history room of the uh, Crawfordsville Public Library where future generations can go there and, and uh, hear hear about these uh, unique uh, experiences. Um, so uh, I will say that uh, our cameraman today is Ed Miller, who is a member of the American Legion, has been very kind to uh, donate his equipment and, uh, uh, and tape uh, and do the camera work for these tapes. Uh, I think uh, now we have we have one of those veterans with us today, and uh, I will say first of all, my name is Bob Wernley, and I'm re representing the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Claire Chamberlain of the American Legion has been very helpful uh, in coordinating this effort. Now today. Uh, well, we're going to going to interview, and I'm going to ask you your name, name, and your okay. place of birth and date of birth. Okay. My name is Eugene Brooks, and I was born in Paris, Illinois, in 1922. At uh, three years later, we moved to Waveland, Indiana, where I uh, attended school and played varsity basketball for four years, where I met my wife Betty Hanley. And uh, in 1950, Betty and I got married, and we moved to Crawfordville in 1951. We moved to 305 Wayne Avenue, and uh, we started to raise our family. And at the time, I was uh, working for the R.R. R. Donnelly Printing Company. And in 59, why we moved to uh, uh, 623 East Pike Street, because, uh, as I say, we started having our family, and we needed more room. And uh, we was fortunate and blessed to have six wonderful children. Uh, we had Debbie, Denise, Diane, and uh, Dawn, and Darren, and David. Uh, Debbie Scruggs, she lives in Crawfordsville, and Denise is single, she lives in Crawfordsville. Dawn uh, married Fred Fruits, and they reside in Texas. Darren lives in South Daytona Beach, where he's work and now employed with the R.R. R. R. Donnelly Printing Company, who prints magazines, and David, who lives in Montezuma. Now, uh, are any of these uh, children of yours uh, beside the one you mentioned working for Donnelly's? Or? No, just the one. Just the just, one. Just Darren, right. yes. Uh -huh. Now, Debbie worked for Crawford Industries. Uh -huh. Now, tell us uh, about your background uh, uh, leading up to the time that you went into the service. Well, I, uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I, I worked, got a job down at uh, Y Palace, which is the... Y Palace? Y Palace. Y Palace. Y. Mm -hmm. It's just an oh. initial Y Palace. It's the interje uh, intersection of 136 and 36, and I worked there approximately five months until I uh, came to Crawfordsville and put my applications in at Donnelly's, and then November the 20th of 1941, I started working for Donnelly's. I worked there approximately a year and a half, and I got my questionnaire to report to service and my physical, which I passed with flying colors. And then August the 18th, I was sworn in at Camp Atterbury, 
And from there, I that went. That was August 18th, what year? Uh, 42. 42. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, I, I was uh, sent to Camp Wheeler, Georgia for my basic training, which is just outside of Macon. And uh, I took uh, 13 weeks of basic training, and then they sent us to Camp. You were in the infantry. I was in the, uh, well, I hadn't been assigned to any branch yet. Okay. So they sent me out to uh, Camp Adair, Oregon, which was an infantry. Uh, mm -hmm. Place. So uh, I was assigned to the 96th Infantry Division. It's called the 96th Infantry Dead Eye Division. Dead Eye? Dead Eye. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, I was in uh, service approximately, uh, see, we went on maneuvers on Ben Oregon and uh, then we went to Fort Lewis, Washington, where they said anyone could return for a 10 day furlough, which was great after a year and a half of mm -hmm. being on a desert. So uh, I took my furlough, and when I was home, I got a telegram to report back to San Luis Obispo, California, where I'd never heard of before. But anyway, I had to go to Indianapolis and change my plane or my train tickets, and I reported back to San Luis Obispo. At the time, they uh, had a jeep waiting for me, and they took us to the ship. And at that time, we shipped over and went to Hawaii. We went to a place called Tent City. We took two weeks of training at let's, Tent City. Uh, let's back up here. Uh, you, and uh, talk about some of those experiences down at uh, basic training and uh, <laughs> you, you tell us anything about that? Well, in basic training it was pretty rough. 13 weeks you couldn't get a pass, you couldn't do anything. We went on 25 more uh, 25 mile force marches which was a full field pack and we do that at least once a week and uh, our old colonel thought anyone that gets in good condition can go through a good war. Uh -huh. And believe me, he tried to get us in good condition, I'll tell you. How did, how did you feel you were in good condition? I was in when great. Got done? Many times I'd come home and my feet was all blistery, but uh, I never did fall out of a, a march. Not the first time, but uh, it paid off for me. I really think it did. It built our legs up and got us in good shape. Uh -huh. It really did. Now, uh, uh, you spoke of uh, going, taking a train out to, uh, out to the West Coast. Yeah, that's right. Well, first, see, uh, coming from uh, Washington, it took us three days and two nights to get to Crawfordville. So I didn't have too many days at home on a 10-day furlough. But oh. as I say, I got a telegram to report back to San Luis Obispo. So then I had to go to Indianapolis and change my, uh, my train uh, tickets back to there. And at that time, uh, there was a gas rationing on. And... Uh, uh, Bill Red in the Browns Valley uh, always was looking out for the serviceman, so he collected some of these stamps from the farmers that wasn't using all of them. And uh, at that one time, he gave me five gallons of stamps so I could go to Indianapolis and change my train ticket. <laughs> oh, he, he did that for many, many people. He was a wonderful What person. was his name? Bill Red. He run the uh, gas station in Browns Valley, uh -huh. there on the turn. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you went out to, uh, you reported to San Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo, California, that's right. And what did you find out when you got out there? Well, they uh, signed me uh, and said, uh, you're going to be shipping out right away. So they took us to a ship that was uh, ready to go. Was that your same division? The same, not, well, the 96th Infantry Dead Eye Division. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, tell us about your uh, trip on the ship. Well, we spent uh, 32 days on that ship because we could only go three miles an hour and we had to change course every two to three minutes because of... Did you have any escort? Uh, we had several sh uh, ships with us in our escort, yes. Mm -hmm. You were in a convoy then? Convoy. It was a mm -hmm. convoy. There was uh, 68 ships in our convoy. Were there uh, uh, cruisers or, uh, protecting you? Oh, yes. We had cruisers all, all on all sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where did you first land? Where did well, we uh, we landed at Waikiki Beach, believe it or not, and they had the boats there, and uh, uh, they brought us into uh, shore and uh, took us to Tent City, where we took a few uh, days of training, and then they said, well, fellas, you're going to go back on the ship. So we went back to USS Bolivar. Oh, well, Bolivar? U.S. Bolivar. Well, Simon Bolivar. That's right. Okay. And there was 1,700 of us, people of the 96th Infantry, on that one ship. I was on the second deck, which was mm -hmm. below water line. Oh. And I was kind of, you know... Did, was, they have, did they have a king-size bed for you on there? Uh, they had pretty, several beds, king-size bed. <laughs> but I, I timed myself from the time I started 
uh, climbing the rope to get to the upper deck so I could get out, it took me three minutes. So if a torpedo would have hit on the side of the ship below water line, see, I was, that's what was what really you was scary. You had to climb a rope to get up? Rope ladder, yes, from one deck to the other. Yes, sure did. Yep. Oh. You slept in the hammocks? Hammocks, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. They were uh, pretty crowded? It was very crowded, yeah. very crowded. Tell us about the food on board the, the food, ship. The food was very good, very good. We, we couldn't complain about the food on the ship at all. They give you finger bowls and all that sort oh, yes, of thing. Oh yes, they sure did. <laughs> it was it was really nice. I, I in fact I hated to get off the ship because I knew what was going to come. You know. Yeah. Then. Was it a British crew or was it an American crew? It was American crew. Uh -huh. And uh, all right, you were on Hawaii and you left Hawaii. Where'd you go? Then we set sail for Lady in the Philippines. Lady. Lady. L e y t e. Okay. It, it's a real a big island. Had mountains on it. And uh, we hit the uh, lady. About what date was this? That was in October of 43 that we hit the uh, lady in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And we spent a long time on lady because, as I say, it was a lot. Uh, there wasn't it wasn't well a well populated with Japanese, but uh, there was several. And uh, we had to go up in the mountains and uh, clear all that out. And we spent 196 days on Okinawa just. Uh, you mean on Lady? On Lady, uh, yes, not on Okinawa, I'm yeah. sorry. On Lady, and uh, we go on these scouting patrols, and we have to go up in the mountains, and uh, it was quite an experience. Well, now, what uh, what were you scouting for? Well, they had a lot of Japanese that was up in the mountains, and... Uh, and you had to root them out? Root them out, yes, sir. Uh, and uh, did you have any, any experiences that you'd like to tell us about? scaring these Japanese out of these... Well... Uh, where, how were they hidden? They were well camouflaged. They uh, they had a lot of dug-in, what I call, caverns in the mountainside that you couldn't hardly spot because they had uh, the entrances well concealed that you couldn't hardly see them. But uh, uh, I didn't have too many bad experiences there excepting the, uh, the Japs started sending buzz bombs, which is a big flying box car. That's what they were known as. And, uh, and the idea, it wasn't that the shrapnel or anything would hurt you, it was that they'd uh, dig a big ta uh, cavern and uh, flying rocks and uh, they'd just bury you alive. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got my left leg. I had a rock to hit on my left leg and uh, it kind of laid me up for a while, but uh, I survived that. I, I did go back in the hospital for now, three did you, weeks. Now, you had to go, uh, they sent you back to the hospital? Off the front line for three weeks, yes. Where did you go to the hospital? Just what they called a tent. Uh, they just built up a tent uh, aid station on uh -huh. Lady. And uh, one experience I'll never forget, I looked up one morning and believe it or not, I met Blue Ayers, who uh -huh. was a conscientious objector and he was working for this orderly, uh, this uh, doctor, and he was this doctor's orderly. And I got to meet Blue Ayers when I was uh -huh. in the hospital. And there he was a great field. guy in the Philippines on Lady. Uh -huh. I sure did. Uh -huh. Is he still living? He's still living, still making movies. Uh -huh. Still making movies. Yeah. Uh, now you got to you got to meet him. Did you? Was there anything more than just meeting him? Or no, you? I just got to shake hands with him, and he uh -huh. introduced, told me who he was, and I recognized him because I'd seen a lot of uh -huh. his earlier movies, and that was quite an experience. Uh -huh. But he he uh, took very good care of us. He was uh -huh. real concerned about his service. Yeah. Man. Now, uh, tell us about those. Uh, scouting patrols that you went on up there. Uh, how many would be in a patrol? And we'd have 12 men, 12 men, and we'd send out one scout ahead, approximately 20 feet, and then he would send back anything that he would spot. And we also had uh, two flank men and one in the rear, and we was well guarded, and we all had binoculars, and we all carried our M1 rifles. Uh -huh. And uh, any time that any, any commotion was spotted, well, we would uh, automatically uh, band them together and attack. And uh, thank the goodness, a lot of times it felt we, the Japanese didn't have, uh, it wasn't armed very well. Uh huh. They'd run out of ammunition. So. Did you really uh, scare many of them out? Did you? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I can't remember the final count on Lady, just on these scouting patrols, but it, it was a pretty high number. It really uh -huh. was. And uh, uh, what, what did you do? Uh, 
Did you kill them? Oh no, we took them captive. Took them captive. Everyone we possibly could, we took captive. But if they did open fire on us, naturally we had to take, take yeah. our own stand. But I would say this one patrol alone took over 60 captives, and I think they wanted to be taken captive because they was starving, they had no food. Mm -hmm. They was really finding it tough, so they didn't give us much fight at all. Mm -hmm. What about the Filipinos? Uh, did you uh, did you get did you see many Filipinos? At uh, when we first uh, landed on the beach, there wasn't any. But when we started going up in the mountains and the hillsides, we'd run into a few, but not too many. I was surprised, and come to find out, uh, they'd uh, had a ship come in and, and took a lot of the Filipinos off of the island while we were on there. Mm -hmm. Were they uh, were these Filipinos uh, members of the uh, armed services or were they just a few of them was they called them uh, uh, guerrillas they were called oh. guerrillas but they uh, they were attached with the Filipino army in a way mm -hmm. and uh, they would uh, they joined in with us and they was very friendly with us did they were they a big help they was a very big help for us uh -huh. yes because they knew the territory and the terrain and everything and they would. Uh, they done a great job of showing us where where some of the Japs were uh -huh. hid, you know. Yeah. Did you, uh, you say that Japs weren't very well armed. Uh, what armor did they have? Well, a few of them had carbines, which isn't a heavy, it wasn't a long range uh -huh. rifle. It wasn't accurate either. Mm -hmm. So uh, they didn't give us uh, too much trouble at all. And as I say, uh, this one outfit, there was about, I'd say, 18 of them, and they only had three rounds of ammunition between all, all 18 of them, so we didn't uh -huh. have any problem with them at all. Yeah. Uh, you'd uh, take them captive and you'd send them back, and where, or what do they do with those? They send yeah. them all the way back to the beach, and uh, at, at that time they would evacuate them back to Guam. Mm -hmm. See, Guam was the main island of the headquarters for all captives. Yeah. So they would send them back that way. Yeah. When you were on uh, the Philippines, what kind of living conditions did you have? Uh, the first three days was terrible because they had a lot of rice paddies. And the rice paddies is uh, got a lot of water in it. And we had to spend a lot of time wading in the water to get from one place to the other. And uh, the first three days, our uh, people couldn't get our equipment up for us, our own rationing couldn't get up to us, so we, uh, we lived on the sugar cane mostly, and then uh, when we started getting up in the mountains, we found banana trees. We had bananas. Oh, darn. So we were thankful for that, too, uh -huh. but that sugar cane come in so good. Uh -huh. it, it was really good. Oh, sugar cane, you mean you just really eat the raw just cane? Just cut it and suck the good stuff out of it, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a, and did you, when did you get your... Uh, regular rations. When they, did, the third day they start dropping rations in to us. They had to drop them in because as they say our vehicles couldn't go through the rice paddies. The terrain was too rough for them. So uh -huh. they started dropping them in to us and uh, that worked out very good. But uh, one time the Japanese got some of our rations and uh, kind of run us short but uh, we made sure the next time they didn't, didn't do that. Did you, uh, what about your, your living, uh, sleeping? How did you sleep? Well, we always, First of all, you were in those rice paddies, why well, did you sleep? We always uh, managed to find a high spot where we wouldn't have to lay in the water, and then we'd dig, dig our foxholes. But we just as well slept in the rice paddies because it seemed like every day, about 4 o'clock, 4.30, we'd get dug in and it'd start raining. And there it was, our foxhole that'd be full of water. That's right. And that during the night up there, it got so cold. And there we was, all we had was our ponchos, and they didn't do us a bit of good. Mm -hmm. A lot of times our clothes would almost freeze to our bodies. It got oh. that cold. Uh -huh. Did you uh, become ill from that? I, I got down sick one time and I thought I was going to die, but I came out of that and uh, I started feeling so much better and I felt that much better. A long time after that is when I had schistosomiasis because of uh, waiting in the rice paddies, but that didn't show up until we'd already taken Okinawa. That, uh, Schistosomiasis, I hope I'm pronouncing that's that right. Uh, that's a tropical disease, is it? Uh, well, what it is, it's a, a little fluke that gets in the water that was in the rice paddies and it boils through the poison your skin. Oh. And gets into your blood, uh, bloodstream, and goes to your liver, lungs, intestines, yeah. and all over your body. Yes. Have you had any recurrence of that in recent years? 
The last attack I had was in 1956, which has been uh, 35 years. What ago. do you do about that when, you, or if you had an attack now, would you go to a veterans hospital? I, or? I got a what they call a private card that I can go to the veterans hospital over at Indianapolis, and they have my records over there, and they uh, there's no way they can refuse treatment for no. me. No. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have that. Uh, when you have an attack of that disease, does that lay you out? To, oh yes, for a, it sure does, yes, it, until you take a treatment. But see, I haven't had one for 35 years, so I've almost well, completely uh, forgot about it, thank goodness. Okay. But uh, during the uh, time I did have it, uh, the first treatment they come out with uh, uh, Tartar Medic, which was a good treatment. And uh, that, that's what cured me, I think, mm -hmm. I really do. But, what, uh, what did you say, that was Tartar? Tartar Medic. It's, it's a fluid that they uh, insert into your bloodstream or, in, or directly into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. They start out with two cc's, and then four, and then eight, and the last is 16 units, and it takes three hours to give it. Mm -hmm. And they can't give it too fast because it cuts off your breathing. Mm -hmm. Well, you had that uh, some 30 years ago. 36 years ago was the last attack I ever mm -hmm. had, yes. Now, we're we're still on the field in, on Lathy. Did you go to? Well, I and didn't. I didn't. That didn't. Uh, the disease didn't hit me until I got on Okinawa after okay. the campaign was over. And we went on up to Okinawa on LST 1055, and it took us two days. And in, in the meantime, well, we're getting off of Lady now. Did any <coughs> tell us anything more that may have happened on Lady? No, we secured the island as I say in 196 days. When you you don't mean you your division secured the whole island. They was uh, first uh, first army division was on the other side of the island with us, and when we joined forces, and and secured the island, well that's that's when we uh, brought up the reserves and they took over the island then. Okay, all right then. So uh, after 196 days, you left Leyte, okay, and tell us about your departure where you went. Okay, we boarded the LST-1055, which is just for one division. It held all of our division. It was a small ship, but it was awful rough, and uh, I never will forget when we was on uh, en route to Okinawa, Tokyo Rose came on the radio that we could get on our ship radio, and she said she feels so sorry for the boys on LST-1055 because they'll never make it to Okinawa. <laughs> Yeah. How'd that make you feel? That that was pretty scary, pretty scary. <laughs> but uh, good Lord willing, we made it, and we hit uh, Okinawa Easter Sunday. Well, now there were other LSTs besides 1055. She didn't mention any. No, she didn't call anyone but ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went up uh, as on a convoy also to from Lady to Okinawa. And, uh, there was several other ships with us. And uh, tell us about the living conditions on the. Uh, on the LST? Uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, we had so many boys that got seasick because uh, it got so rough we was dipping water on both sides of the ship because it's a small ship and it was rocking so much we would dip water on one side and it rolled back the other way. And thank, I was thankful I wasn't on deck. Some of the boys were sleeping on deck but I was on the, on the just below deck and... Uh, they give you pails to get rid of that oh, water? <laughs> Boy, it was terrible, but as I say, I was fortunate all of the time I was in service, I never got seasick. Uh -huh. But we had a sergeant that as soon as he got on a boat, he'd get seasick. And they say that is terrible, and I, I agree, after watching him, he turned green. He really did. <laughs> <laughs> his name was Verlin Forsyer, and he passed on two years what ago. Was, what was his name? Verlin J. Forsyer. He, he, How do you spell that? V-E-R-L-I-N-F-O-R-C-I-E-R, Forsyer. Forsyer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he passed on two years ago. We got cards. We still get Christmas cards from his wife, Mary, and mm -hmm. she's a wonderful person. Now, what was your rank? Were, were you still a private or PFC? Or? No, I made a PFC uh, just before we le left uh, uh, Camp Adair. And then when we went to Fort Lewis, Washington, I got my uh, uh, corporal stripes. And then uh, when we got back and I went to San Luis Obispo, they said, uh, you're going to go up for another promotion. So I went up to Buck Sergeant. And then when we got to uh, Hawaii, I went to Staff Sergeant. And I led a, a I was a platoon uh, guide on, on mm -hmm. Lady, mm -hmm. which is a Staff Sergeant. Yeah. 
in other words, when this scouting group would go out on Lady, you would be in charge that, of that. Non-com had to be in charge of any scouting patrol that went out. Uh -huh. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. As a staff sergeant, either a buck or a staff could do. Either mm -hmm. one could take a, uh, a buck could take a, a squad out, but a, a staff had to go with a platoon if he took the whole platoon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Now we're on the LST. What? Uh, any other experiences on the LST? Not only listen to Tokyo Rolls, and uh, we had good food on the, on that too. We really did. We had. Well, tell us about one of those. What does Tokyo Rolls? What does she do besides just? Uh, well, she she always made the brags about. Well, I'm going to go out with my boyfriend tonight, and we're going to have a good time. Uh, says no poor boys on LST. There's no way. Says they they may not go out. But their wives probably will, and you know, just rubbing it the wrong way, and she really got some of the boys upset. But uh, she's not too much on me because I wasn't a married man, and uh, I, in fact, I wasn't even going steady at the time. See? So it didn't affect me too much. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, what about where did you go from there? Well, that's when we uh, started uh, watching our ships bomb Okinawa. We pulled out in the harbor. And all the ships started bombing uh, Pearl Harbor, and the planes come in and drop napalm gas. That's big tanks of gas that would explode and burn. And they did that two consecutive days while we was out watching it going on. Uh, all day and all night? All day and all night. They continue bombing, yes. And we still hit resistance when we went in on Easter Sunday at daybreak. We still Easter hit. Sunday in what year? That was in 1944. All right. Uh, you were um, uh, your ships were. Did they anchor you out there and let you? Oh yes, we was see? anchored. Yes, but we was uh, approximately two miles from the island. See, so there, uh, if they had any artillery or anything, couldn't reach our ship. Mm -hmm. Did uh, were these bombers uh, based on uh, uh, on uh, warships on, uh, on, airplane, on carriers? airplane carriers and also. Some of them came up from Guam because it wasn't that uh, that far. They could go back to Guam, and we'd already mm -hmm. taken Guam, see. So they would uh, go back there and uh, get their bombs, and then come back. Was there any uh, ac any uh, artillery, uh, any aircraft artillery? There was a lot of uh, artillery. Yes, they sure. Trying was. to hit those. Trying uh, to hit the planes. Yeah. We're trying to hit mm -hmm. those planes coming in. Mm -hmm. Where did the Japs have any planes? They had a few uh, what I called kamikaze planes, and. Uh, one of them hit, hit one of our hospital ships uh, on purpose. It, it dive bombed right on the, and we had. Did you see that happen? I saw that happen. Yes. Tell us about that. And we had an awful lot of casualties from that because we had a lot of boys that was already on the ship, and some of them had already been injured once, and then this plane hit it, and we we almost lost the ship. I, I I'm sure. I never heard the full uh, report on it, but I'm sure that, that we saved our ship and uh, some of the boys that was on it. But uh, the last estimate I got, there was over 500 boys that was killed on killed that on one, that. one ship. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did uh, this happen while you were waiting out in the when uh, we were still out offshore? On, offshore, yes. That's mm -hmm. what kind of scared you too. That's the reason yeah. I didn't mind too bad when our landing boat come to get us to take us ashore. Uh -huh. I thought it would be safer there. It wasn't as nice sleeping as some places, but uh, I was kind of glad to get out. How are the well, how were the meals on board the LST? We had a big steak the last, the morning that we went in on Okinawa. Big steak breakfast. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, oh, what, uh, ordinarily what kind of meals did you have on it? Usually beans, baked beans. Uh -huh. That was their specialty. <laughs> <laughs> and see, uh, on, on Lady we had all those canned rations, uh, hash and all that good stuff, and K rations. And uh, naturally, when we went in on Okinawa, we had the K rations with us also. And, uh, uh -huh. I was glad we did because they taste pretty good the first couple of days. Yeah. Now, uh, you say this uh, bombing kept going on all day and night, all day and all night, and uh, with very little resistance from the from the Japanese. That's true. Very true. A little anti-aircraft. Little anti-aircraft. And a little of and some planes. I think we only lost one plane actually that I saw. We could have lost more, but I only saw the one that actually hit. Now, Gene, we've got a a map here of Okinawa. Uh, why don't you uh, hold that map up there and uh, let uh, 
Okay. Can you sit that way? Sure, I'll hold it. Okay. And you? I, I'll point it out. Now, my division itself went in what I called on the airfield, which is right uh, beyond Yonaburu, and we took the airstrip. That was our main objective, the 96th Infantry Division. Okay, in the middle of the island was the 76th Infantry Division. They was to our left. And then the 1st Marine and the 6th Marine was all the way over on the other airfield, over on Macpino Bay. And which was close to Naha, which was a big city right off off of the on the island on the coast of the island, and then uh, our main resistance was when we got to Sugar Loaf Hill, which is here, and Chronicle Hill, which is here, and uh, we had an awful hard resistance right there, and it took us 96 days to secure the island. 96 days. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you've got a 77th Infantry is out there in the middle of the island. How did they get there? Well, they had a there's a, a channel that goes right around through uh, uh, what I call this bay. Uh, I can't even pronounce it. It's N-A-K-A-G-U-S-U-K-U Bay. And they went right in through there. And you can see our American flag. And uh, that's where they dropped, made their landing is over here. But we made ours from Yonaburu uh, on the, this bay over here. Mm -hmm. See the Tenth Army uh, tanks uh, was in there on there too. They started sending in the tanks, and that's that was the sight well to see because they could give us protection from any uh, mm -hmm. light uh, machine gun or. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so you uh, you got off the LST, and how did you get ashore? Well, they they got these landing craft boats that can take uh, each platoon. Uh, it'll carry 47 men each boat. And they would take us as far in as they could, and then we would uh, the ramp would come down, and we would wade in the rest of the way, which is usually from the waist deep down to knee deep, maybe. And uh, we'd rush to the shore and get on on shore and make sure that uh, all of our men made it out of the water. Carrying your M1 with you. Carrying all of our equipment with us, you bet. What what was your what equipment did you have beside your M1? Well, we had our uh, shelter half and our full field pack on our backs. That was our shelter half and our trenching tools and mess gear and uh, all the blankets in case we needed them, which we did, and uh, our supplies. We had to have our uh, rations with us on our, in our full field pack. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did you lose many men uh, going ashore there? Uh, my uh, Division on the Okinawa and the initial landing, the first day lost 85 persons. That was the first day. But that was not. Uh, that was injured. That was killed in action. Killed. Killed. And 85 men out of killed. how many? Killed. Out of 187 on the beach. You mean you had? That was a company in our company. See, there's four platoons in a company. See. Yeah. And there's 47 plus your uh, guards. So the total count in a, in one company is 187 men, and I was in I Company of the 383rd Division. Yeah. And uh, they uh, it was the first division or the first uh, th 381st, 382nd, and 383rd, and I was a battalion, and I was in the 383rd Company I. And see, each each uh, each one uh, has uh, four companies in it. A, uh, but uh, I happen to be, see, you got I, J, K, and L companies in one, mm -hmm. see. And I was in I Company, 383rd Regiment. Now, uh, I want to go back and be sure I'm right on this. You had how many men out of how many were killed? We had 85 out of 187 of my division, of my company. Killed? Killed, yes. In other words, you had uh, almost a half of your people were killed. Almost. And how many, uh, how many were injured? It was twelve, only twelve injured, but the rest of them were killed in action. Really, I didn't realize they were. So to show you how lucky I am, uh, this is a statistic I don't know if I should mention or not. I'm uh, one of seventeen men left out of my company, of I Company, which is 187 men. There's only seventeen that survived Okinawa. Only seventeen. Seventeen men. Well, I, I, so, I, I'm very fortunate. Very I'm fortunate. astonished at that. Uh, our, at that figure. Well, uh, our observers uh, couldn't pick up. They estimated there was between twelve and fifteen thousand Japanese on Okinawa. But in the meantime, Okinawa had a tunnel all the way from one end of the island all the way through, and they could bring up people through the night that our observers couldn't spot. 
And you know the final count on that island was 97,000 Japanese on Okinawa. 97,000. 97,000 Japanese. Japanese. And uh, against our two army, or two army divisions and two marine divisions, which is approximately, well, it would be uh, about 2,000 men. So we was outnumbered quite. Well, a wait a minute! There'd be more than 2,000. Well, 2,000 for the army and and 2,000 for the marines, and then you had your uh, tank. So you're talking about seven to eight thousand, maybe eight thousand maximum. Uh -huh. And you had 90, you were against 97,000. Well, you must have had but a lot they, of help. Naturally, they didn't have them all at that time. As I say, they had this uh, underground tunnel that they could keep landing them and bringing them in. After, you know, after we think hmm. we have them wiped out one day, they come back stronger the next day. And we couldn't understand it until we found out this tunnel. And when they, our ships went around and blocked that off, that's when we secured the island so quick. Because they couldn't bring any more. Where, where was that tunnel on this map? Do you know? Okay. As I say, the seventh infantry, the seventy-seventh infantry division came right in here. Okay. They had this escarpment starting right here at Shuri Castle, what I call Shuri Castle, and it went all the way through and all the way down. And you can follow this where it says five hundred and sixty-one feet. That's the height of an escarpment that was mm. on the island, and that's where the. Uh, underground tunnel ended at that escarpment. That's so it run, run all the way from up here at uh, Sherry all the way down to where it... Well, where were the men entering? Where were the Japs entering the tunnel? Well, the ships would bring them in at the, oh. up here at, Sh at Sherry and send them down and then they had the wings coming out where they could send so many men out once at one island or one side of the island one on the other side, see? Mm -hmm. So uh, our observers couldn't pick that off, and boy, it was terrible. Yeah. How long did it take you before that tunnel was discovered? Took, uh, well, we had been on the island approximately uh, three weeks. Did you see the tunnel after? After it was over, I saw I walked a, that tunnel. How big was it? What? You could drive uh, two semi tr trucks side to side down through it. It was that wide. I'll be darned. In. Was it uh, solid rock? or? It was all cut out of rock. Mm -hmm. Sure it was. Well, um, uh, and that Sherry Castle, they, they, that's the reason, this Sherry Castle, if you, as you notice, I pointed out to you, I can't... It's right there, Sherry. Sure. Okay. Okay, the Sherry Castle, that was built out of all stone, and it took, uh, they said, 10,000 people, two years, to build that castle out of that stone, and that stone all come from where they dug it out of that tunnel. Mm. Um, now, um, you uh, when you hit the when you hit the beach was it was it a beach that you hit? It was a beach. It was. It was and uh, well, what happened? Then? You lost all those men. Well, the thing about it, there was about uh, I'd say three to five hundred feet of clearance, because our of our planes uh, strafing and uh, bombing the island, it cleared all the trees and everything out, and it was just a plain view for them. And they dug in so deep that those bombs didn't hurt them. So when we started across that. Clearance. That's when they could get us. Mm -hmm. uh, what did they have? They had machine guns. They had machine guns and mortars. Mortars scares me more than anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they was dropping mortars right close to us because they 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 could uh, send a crew of mortarmen back uh, um, almost a half a mile and drop those mortars right on the beach where we was coming in. See. Mm -hmm. uh, the th thing about it, when when you hit an island like this. The first thing you do, you all get on the island and get down and you start counting your men and getting reconnoitered. In other words, get get organized so you can get your platoon and your squads all together and see how, how you're standing. Mm -hmm. And then you got to report to your company commander. Yeah. You have, uh, did, did you have any officers that you admired? I had two, uh, two that I really uh, admired and both of them got killed. On Okinawa. On Okinawa. Mm -hmm. my, in fact, my platoon sergeant, or my, my platoon leader, got killed. Who was a, a real good friend. He was a second lieutenant, but uh, you had to had to admire the boy. He uh, stuck stuck right with us, and uh, he tried to do a little too much, and uh, he stuck his head up trying to pick out where a machine gun nest was coming from, and they killed him. Mm -hmm. His name was Sergeant Weiner. You mean Lieutenant Wayne? Well, he made he took a field commi commission oh. on Lady, 
Uh -huh. He was a tech sergeant and he took a field commission and yeah. uh, went to a yeah. second lieutenant. Were you still a staff sergeant? I, I stayed staff sergeant until I retired, uh, till I was mm -hmm. discharged. Mm -hmm. well, let's quit here. Okay, we'll take a break. Okay. Okay, uh, Gene, I'm noticing on here, uh, looks to me like there's some railroad tracks there and uh, up here. Did they have, a, were the Japanese using those railroads when you came in? They were using them, still in use when we came in, but uh, we, uh, after we noticed and found them, it didn't take us long to get those destroyed because that was what was killing us and getting all those supplies up to their soldiers that we, could, uh, we couldn't uh, wipe them out. They uh, too strong for us. So we started working on the railroads and uh, we got those and in fact, we started uh, closing the tunnel. We took close the tunnel by putting charges in it. We had our men to come in and put charges in it to close the tunnel, so they couldn't use the tunnel anymore. And uh, how did you, uh, how did you get the railroads uh, how'd you get rid of those? Well, we brought our tanks in with our anti-tank guns and uh, started using those on the oh. railroads and blowing the uh, rails so they could, you know, yeah. wouldn't make, uh, couldn't pass on them. Mm -hmm. What kind of tanks were those? Anti-tanks, great big tanks. Oh my, they uh, weighed. Uh, See, uh, were those Shermans? Is that what Shermans? They... Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was one one thing I was glad when I was going through my basic training. That was one of our requirements. We had to learn to operate a tank. If oh. if it had ever come to it that I had to, I could have got in and operated the tank. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank the Lord, I never had to. Yeah. Um, well, um, did you come uh, face to face with any uh, Japanese while you were on Okinawa? Yes, one time I uh, come in contact with a, I heard one of my boys scream and I uh, went into a, uh, one of these little, pit, what I call a pillbox, and there was seven Japs in there, but thank the Lord the boy had got two of them, and, but there was still five of them alive. They didn't have any ammunition, so I got four of them with my ammunition and I got the fifth one with my bayonet. But in the meantime, I was unfortunate, he got his bayonet in my leg all the way to the bone, and when I uh, released my shot and he dropped dropped the gun, the butt of it was so heavy it started pulling on my leg, so I dropped down onto my one knee to take that pressure off and the, until I could get the bayonet out of my leg. And I still have the scar for it. Mm -hmm. So that was quite an experience. But our men had been instructed never to go into one of those tombs by themselves, but he did. His name was Adaro Weiser, and I still hear from that boy. Oh, he's, and he's, he's still, still alive. alive. And he had 57 stitches taken in his body because of bandits from the Japanese. Go back over that and tell us well, tell us how it happened. What I think we've kind of got, got it a little mixed up here. Uh, you were up on a patrol, were you? We had uh, already had the island patrol, uh, had it under control, our control, and we was trying to uh, make, uh, get our replacements replacements in our platoons because we lost so many men and as we was uh, there and getting all ready getting our company all together this I heard this one boy let out a scream and it was close so I went and another boy started but he stopped and he said well I'll go back the other way I think come the other way and when I went into this escarpment it was these seven Japanese having this one boy down but as I say, he got a couple of them, and I got the other four with my ammunition and the other one with my bayonet. Mm -hmm. But before I could do that, they had him down, and they uh, was really doing a number on him. What were they doing? They was bayoneting him, trying to kill him. Uh -huh. And they, they was doing a good job. As I say, 53, he had 53 stitches taken just in his uh, chest yeah. up here. Now, uh, and then you were, uh, and you described what happened with the bayonet on you. Uh, what uh, did the rest of your squad come in and uh, they all rescue came you? in right away and helped me uh, get to the aid station and they put a tourniquet around my knee, but my leg because it was bleeding so bad. Because when he released it, it tore my leg quite a bit and it was bleeding pretty mm -hmm. profusely. But anyway, uh, they got me back to the, to the aid station and uh, I didn't. Uh, lose any days, but then it was only about three days after that is when I started getting sick with schistosomiasis. Mm -hmm. Now, where did they, uh, they took you back to the aid station? Where'd you go from there? 
Well, that's when they uh, loaded me on a boat and sent me back to Guam mm -hmm. to a rehabilitation center. And then uh, that's when they ran all these tests and found out I had chest osomiasis because I lost, I went from 160 pounds down to 97 pounds in about three weeks' time. Mm. I couldn't eat and I had dysentery so bad and uh, as I say, you couldn't keep food down at all. In, in other words, the food was the last thing you wanted. So that's when they started me on those treatments and uh, I took uh, five treatments uh, all. How uh, well, you were out there in Guam? No, I took three there, and then I took uh, two at Letterman General Hospital. They shipped you back to the Sh States. Shook huh? me, uh, flew me back. They didn't Please. ship me. They flew uh, 27 of us, flew back on the plane. And of the 27, there was only eight of us alive when we got back to the States. The others had passed out on the plane because of schisto. Did they die of they it? They died of it. And see, at that time, they give uh, you three to six months to live when they found out you had uh, schistosomiasis. Because mm -hmm. it was something that uh, our doctors didn't know anything about, and uh, uh, as I say, they had two treatments. First, I started taking Fuadin, which they thought was a good cure for it. Taking what? Fuadin, F-U-I-D-I-E-N. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took two treatments of that, and I kept still getting sick. So they sent me from Letterman General, flew me from Letterman General Hospital to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, to what I call Moore General Hospital, which was just outside of Swannanoa, North Carolina. And that was in October. I stayed in the, from October until uh, March the 12th when they gave me a furlough. Of what year? Uh, for, that was in 45, uh, 45 and 46, from October hmm. of 45 until uh, March hmm. of 46, when I got discharged March the 15th. Oh. And April the 15th, I was over at the VA hospital taking another treatment, a tartar medic, oh. a month after I got discharged. And, uh, well, let's uh, talk a little bit more about Okinawa. Uh, did you have, uh, you had a large number of casualties on Okinawa. Uh, these replacements that were coming in, uh, do, were they coming in as a separate division or did they uh, fill us? Uh, they were just filling our openings, our casualty open. openings, mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. Some of those boys was only 18, 19 years old, but when I went in service, in 42, they wouldn't take anyone that was under 20 years mm. of age. Yeah. But uh, I know we had this one boy, I, I just have to mention this one kid's name. I won't say his name because it might get back, but he was only 15 years old, and he was in my platoon. And oh. he let it slip one time, and I found out for sure that he was 15. So two days later, he was on the ship back to the States, because mm -hmm. there uh, wasn't any way he could stay with us. 15 yeah. years old. He wanted to get in service so bad that he volunteered and enlisted when he was 15 years of age. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned uh, the Japanese jumping off the escarpment. Uh, that escarpment was down That's Down here where it says 561 feet and it was straight down and uh, uh, when we started pushing them back, as I say, all of these divisions kept pushing down this way and when we got them that far and they had no other place to go they started jumping off of the escarpment, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture to say how many that committed Harry Carey, or that's what they call it. Yeah, I did. Uh, and did you see the pile of bodies down there at the? No, I bank? never got that far because, that, as I say, at that time I was getting an awful, being an awful sick boy. Oh, I see. Did that's you? when Shisto started really hitting me. Oh. No, I, the farthest I got down was probably right in here. And well, they, they uh, took me then right over here to this, whatever that, I can't even pronounce that name. <laughs> Gus or Sean or Gus something Gus Sean. Like? They took me there and that's where I loaded, they loaded me on a boat and I went back to Guam. And I was there two days and they flew uh, the rest of us back by plane. Uh -huh. yep. C-54 plane. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, but uh, I can say one thing, I uh, went under the Golden Gate Bridge going over and I flew over coming back. Uh -huh. and they brought me into Letterman General Hospital. Now you've mentioned a couple of your buddies that you still hear from. Oh yes. Do you attend reunions? Uh, we have a 96th Infantry uh, reunion every year. We've had it for 27 years and we uh, have it in different states. Now this uh, year I think it's going to be out in Eugene, Oregon because that's where we took our uh, some of our maneuvers. Uh, 
Betty and my wife and I went to Detroit, and we went to Indianapolis twice, and we went to Bloomington, Illinois once. So uh, uh, we got a real good friend that lives in Mackinac, Illinois, Henry J. White, and I talked to him on the phone last week, and he is uh, battling cancer right now. And uh, he's got it, cancer. He's got cancer real bad. Mm -hmm. So, so he Betty won't and be able I, to go. he's going to try. He has missed one for uh, 21 years. Uh huh. And the Betty and I was going to try and, and uh, drive over to Mackinac, which is a, quite a drive. It's about a three and a half hour drive over to Mackinac, which is outside yeah. of Bloomington. It's quite a drive, but we're going to go over and see the boy before anything yeah. happens. Or hope, hope, hopefully we can get there before anything happens. Yeah. Do you uh, have any other friends you're still you still hear from? That's about the only ones. Mm. The only ones. When you go to these reunions of the of the division, uh, do you see fellows that you knew? I have a picture at home that Betty and I took last year. They have, uh, they was uh, six of our original guys with their wives that we uh, got together in my platoon, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a picture taken. And I, I should have brought it, but it's at home, and I value that picture very much. Now, you uh, you met somebody else uh, in your experiences over there. Uh, who was that? Well, he was pretty well known for what he done for the servicemen, and that was Ernie Pyle. I got to meet the man, and he got us more money, as I mentioned. Uh, well, now you didn't. Com you really haven't mentioned it on this one. Uh, you got uh, you got the combat infantry infantry badge. Combat infantry badge, which meant ten dollars more per month. And as I say, when I went in service in '42, I was making uh, twenty-one dollars a month. And when I got my PSC, I went up to thirty-two dollars. And then when I went to Corporal, I got up all the way up to fifty-five dollars, and I thought, boy, that's great. And when I got to staff sergeant, I was making seventy-eight dollars a month, and uh, that was great too. But anyway, then Ernie met me on Okinawa, and uh, in fact, uh, three days before he was killed, he was killed on a small island just off of Okinawa. And uh, as I say, that infantryman badge meant ten dollars more per month. Uh, what, what do you mean that he got you the in combat infantry? Right? He was the one that kept stressing that if anyone can go through all these tests and with flying colors like a compass, cor a compass uh, course, a bayonet course or anything, should be given more money and uh, he got it for us. And I passed it with flying colors, I might add. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure proud of it. I still have that combat yeah. infantry. Yeah, did you bring it with you today? Yes, I have it. Why don't you show it? I also brought my two lapel buttons. This is what our 96th Infantry Division wore. Hold it up so the camera can see it. These are two of our insignias that we carried on each side of our lapel. And then here is my pride and joy, Combat Infantryman's Badge. Can you see this? That's a Combat Infantryman's Badge that Ernie Powell got for us. And here is my Asiatic ribbons and uh, my bronze uh, thing, and also I got the Purple Heart. Yeah. Now, did you bring your Purple Heart with you? I didn't today. I, oh. I knew I left it oh. sitting right on the table. Uh, I'm real proud of it. I got yeah. the Purple Heart and the cluster, with bronze the, star. With bron one bronze star? One bronze star. I brought That's the paper. That's for two... Uh, for two, uh, I was wounded three times, but three times. you get the uh, Purple Heart and I got the Bronze Star twice. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, have you got any other, uh, what about those telegrams that you have? Uh, well, I brought a couple that my mother received while I was in service, and also I brought some papers showing that uh, I had definitely received the Purple Heart. Here's the first order, it says award of the Purple Heart to Staff Sergeant Eugene A. Brooks, 35563947. That was on July the 13th of 1945. Uh -huh. And then, as I say, my mother received two uh, telegrams. This is a list of some of the people, I'll turn around this way, this is a list of some of the people that was awarded the Purple Heart yeah. also with me. All right, let's look at those telegrams. That uh, That's kind of interesting. That's, uh, okay. I'll, let, I'll give it to you, and you can, uh, there's the two right there. Uh, now, your mother got these telegrams. I see this. Uh, there's one dated uh, 
May 9th, is it May 9th, 1945? Right. And then June 7th, 1945. And uh, uh, your mother received these... Uh, through the mail. That's through the mail. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, no, they, they was right delivered. Here, delivered to her door, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, Sergeant Brooks, Eugene A., was slightly wounded on Okinawa, uh, 9th of April, 1945. Continue to address mail to him as normally or until uh, another address is received from him. And it's signed J. A. Julio, Adjutant General. And then, of course, this is the second one, That's and one. it also uh, uh, tells of uh, of a new address for you. Okay. All right. Uh, That's the one that says severe was severely wounded. If I remember right, one of them had. And that's the one that could rather shook her up because she didn't know just what. Yeah. Well, uh, it was a kind of a shocking thing. Oh yes. Sure uh, do you know how those were delivered? No, I don't. I never did ask mother. I think they used to just uh, uh, somebody from Western Union just used to bring them out bring to, them the to the house. house. I, I think suppose. that's the way they did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Gene, uh, we've got a you've done a great job here telling us about your experiences. Anything else that uh, that you thought of that uh, we ought to cover? No, the only thing that I'm sure proud that I got to fight for my country. Mm -hmm. I believe in it sincerely. Yeah. Really and uh, your uh, your kids are proud of you. They sure are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we sure do. Thank you. Appreciate you coming up and telling us all this. And yeah. we're gonna we're gonna put this tape in a public library. In fact, we're gonna probably put two copies of it there. We're gonna give you a copy of it. That'd be great. And uh, uh, so that uh, when your great great grandchildren are around this place, why they can say, well. That'd be fine. Yeah. I have five grandchildren now. Uh, they can. <laughs> That'd be great. They can be great. Hear your experiences That'd and see you telling about it. Right. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Okay. It was coming through, though, was it?